I do think what will happen is some people, if they're unhappy, will just quietly build their raft to leave. And you may not realize that's happening if you're not checking in. Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. (laughs) And inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. So here's my story. I was having lunch with a a friend the other day, and he was talking about what everybody talks about, especially when you have one of your first in-person lunches with somebody who hasn't been in your quarantine circle. He was talking about the um, different ins and outs and decisions that have to be made about his company coming back to work. And Mm. my friend is a senior, um, a member of the management team for a large company. And one of the things he told me was this. He said that there's still resistance in his office from some people, and by his office, I mean across the country, um, to coming back to work. And he talked about one conversation in particular with a person they view as kind of a an up-and-comer in their organization. And the next step for this person is to be a project manager. So this guy was talking to my friend and said, okay, I, you know, what do I need to do to be a project manager? So they listed all the things and he had accomplished a number of them. But the last thing my friend said, which he thought was a no brainer is, you know, well, so you're going to have to be in the office for X, Y, and Z. And the guy goes, well, I don't really feel comfortable being back in the office. I'm fine in the field, but I, I don't feel like being back in the office. And my friend was saying, well, if you want to be a project manager, you have to be in the office. We're not forcing you to come back into the office. You know, you, it's not like you're fired if you don't. Right. But you can't take the next step because we believe it's important. They're a fairly traditional firm. We believe it's important to lead your team in person. And there are certain facets to the leadership that we expect that cannot be accomplished through Zoom meetings. Um. And there, you can debate the merits, you know, are they right? Are they wrong? I think that they, there's really good reason for them to insist on some in-person, but that's not my point. My point is Wait, where, you have a point? <laughs> yeah, I have a point. Um, so sometimes, you know, we've talked about, well, you have to respect employees' feelings because um you don't get to debate whether they're legitimately worried about coming back. If you're concerned about coming back, that's a personal thing and your feelings are, are legitimate. But at the same time, there is, or this is the question that I'd ask you, um, whether there is, as I believe, a limit to the extent to which a company has to um, yield to those hesitations. Um, you know, you have to treat them with respect, but do you have to treat them as um, the governing factor in what you do? And this company that my friend um, is part of clearly doesn't. They've drawn a line and say, if you want to do X, you're coming back to work. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, because I'm, I'm, I, as you were talking, I'm aware that we did an episode not too long ago that, that sort of dabbled around this same topic, but I have no problems tackling it again because it is it's the conversation that the majority of my clients are navigating their way through. And it's so interesting to hear the different perspectives all over the place and the different variables, you know, because there's the variable of masks, there's the variable of, you know, distancing in general, just being back at the office at all, being in indoor spaces with other people. For some people, they haven't even been in indoor spaces masked other than maybe like grocery stores and whatnot, where you're, where you sort of feel like you're in breezing around versus like sitting in a space all day. Um, there's, there's masks, there's the same whole conversation with vaccines, whether, you know, which, which I think isn't up the ante level of some of these things and whether or not you come back in person, like those three variables. And then the in-person one has so many variants of, that just gets even more complicated, I think, because there are not just the safety and anxiety pieces, which I definitely want to come back to, but there's also just like the quality of life thing, you know, for people who still have their kids at home doing school virtually, you yeah. know, that that's, that's just an 
unget aroundable variable or, or the fact that like, I've just, I really like being able to, it's funny, you and I even had this conversation. I said, well, now that we're both completely vaccinated, we could in theory start recording in our fancy pants recording studio we <laughs> made and never got to use except like once. Um, and both of us were like, well, that could be cool. And it's super convenient to schedule our things because it doesn't involve me driving up to your office, which I used to be up there all the time. And now I'm not. So it yep. is, it, it does add a whole, it would take an, an extra hour out of my day to drive up there and drive back down again. And so th there are just all these different things. And, and then you take all those variables and you put them into an office where then it gets fractured again between like different members of a management team. I have a couple clients where the management teams have very different perspectives on what they should be doing and when and to what degree. And then you have every employee that it affects. And it this is solidly one where I have lots, a long list of questions and curiosities and I don't have great answers because it's it, it just feels very complicated because because you said an interesting phrase. You said, um, you know, where's the line where a company has to accommodate? And I I don't I don't know that you. I mean, I'd have to think this through before I make it sound like an absolute. I, I, you know, a company can stipulate whatever it wants in theory. Um, there's but there's bigger. I think it's dangerous when companies are resistant to talking through the things because they imagine it as purely an indulgent thing. Like we don't want to indulge, you know, the rules not applying to everyone kind of thing. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, if you, I'm making air quotes, force your employees to come back and be doing things that they feel unsafe, like that anxiety is going to show up in the, in the, team interaction and, you know, if it's frontline people and they don't feel comfortable with employee, with, you know, random customers coming in unmasked, they're going to be cranky or, you know, I mean, it, it's going to show up. It's not like you can just force people to do things and then like there won't be any other ripple effects or, or no, there, there will be ripple effects. I mean, and it, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, especially where uh, where we are, you know, there are snow days where you have some employees who think, well, it's snowing outside, but I can make it in. But there's no ramifications for the employees that don't make it in. But, you know, so you have that possible resentment among employees. But you you have the issue from a policy standpoint where I, as the owner of a company, can't force you as an employee to get vaccinated. Right. That's a that's a personal health decision. You may decide that that you don't know what's in the vaccine. It's dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. You may have concerns. And I can't force you to put a chemical in your body. Right. Um, now, if I if I then say, all right, well, whether you go vaccinated or whether you don't, that's your choice. However, in order to do your job here, mm -hmm. you have to come in. Then I've got a couple facets to that. One is you are not vaccinated. But I'm not giving you a choice as, as far as employment is concerned of staying in your bubble or where you stay safe because you're going to have to expose yourself to other people. The second facet is I've made a decision for my other people that right. somebody who has not been vaccinated um, is is yeah. going to be here regularly. Right. And, and it, it kind of reminds me one one thing right before we hit record, you said. I um you were driving right by my office and you almost came in for a, a drop by, which would have been wonderful. But if you imagine that same scenario, but you haven't been vaccinated. Yeah. Right. And the people who have just come back in my office see somebody outside the normal circle of our team just walk in. Is that cool? Is that not? You know, it's and, and here's the real problem with that. It's it's not like I'm wearing a V sweatshirt that, Correct. you know, stipulate. So they have no idea whether. Right. And, and I think that is the part that has that has really gotten complicated most recently and why I don't mind hitting this topic again is the CDC's guidelines that, you know, fully vaccinated people can walk around maskless, you know, even indoors and it's fine. Well, that then relies on you know, sort of this honor system of right. maybe especially because the people who, you know, there's a high 
like there are reasons people don't get vaccinated other than that would be tied to this. But I don't think it's unfair to say the Venn diagram of people who aren't getting vaccinated and think masks are stupid anyway it has a pretty big overlap. And so that likelihood that, and, and here's a really funny, interesting thing too, though, that I think is actually a little bit off topic, but I but I do think factors in here somewhere. I have heard a number of, pe- of people half jokingly, but but there's a little truth in every joke, make cracks about, well, I, I think the science is there, but, um, you know, because they've looked into it and read about it, but I'm hesitant about not wearing a mask because I don't want people to think that I am an anti-mask person, you know, that they, they're they laying in the-, the poli- There is the, baggage with that. The, the baggage or the political or whatever we want to call it. And what's so interesting to me about that was whatever talk show or article or whatever it was, um, I think it might've been a post from the March for Science uh, Facebook page or something. It was cautioning to be really careful about the, um, you know, if you are someone who has leaned on science and and really wants there to be choices about science, um, you know, from a scientific perspective, be careful that you aren't holding on to an old or, or a now evolved scientific perspective and now choosing by feelings, which is what you were judgy about before, you know, so it's like, if, you know, if you want to be someone who relies on science and stay up with the science and not be held back by those kinds of things, but it's just yet another crazy layer in all of this. And speaking of, of judgy, it was funny because I was talking to, uh, Allie, um, uh, yesterday and she had just come back from a visit to Charleston. South Carolina, which is a wonderful city, et cetera. But she she said she had a terrific time. There was only one incident that marred it. And she and uh, her boyfriend went into a bar and they were sitting there enjoying the music and, and um, having some appetizers. And she she got up to use the restroom and she put on her mask. And she was accosted by somebody who was in the bar saying, you just, we don't need to wear masks around here. You can take your, if that's what you're about, you can take your blue attitude and get out of the bar. Whoa. And see, that's where I don't understand. Like, like, stunned I, by, but it's I, the judgy I, yeah. thing though. It's yeah. just, I mean, heightened to a 10. Heightened to a 15, maybe yeah. even. I mean, I, that's so bizarre because like, I, I don't get, but get being that, uh, up in arms about something that actually affects you. Like, like if, if, if Allie was walking around demanding that everyone else put on a mask while she walked to the bathroom, then right. I could see that kind of reaction. That, that would be a but problem. But why yes. does someone care if someone else is wearing a mask? Well, but you that's, know, it's, it's, that's a whole larger conversation about, right. and just to throw out, this is, this is like a little explosion and then we can just move on and act like it never existed. I always felt the same thing about gay marriage, which is yes. why do I care if somebody finds love with, with somebody of the same gender or whatever, why do I care? But- there is a very, very <laughs> large stack of things that I think fall into that category. Um, yeah. And and there's uh, there's actually a Michael Stipe quote um, that if I said properly, we would have to make this an explicit episode. So I will just bleep at that point. Um, or I'll say it and make Tom bleep it out. But uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to put Tom through that extra effort. But it was really interesting because, you know, and I was explaining this to my kids because it was even sort of harder for them to understand that that, that recently ago, it it wasn't that common for celebrities to be open about their sexuality, oh, right. you know, which, which even I'm like, Oh yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't very long ago. And you just didn't think about it, but he was being pressed in an interview um, on some talk show or something about whether or not he was gay. And uh, he said, look, at the end of the day, the only, the only, uh, the only people who need to be concerned about what I do with my bleep is if you're sitting on my lap. <laughs> and I was like, I love that. Like, it really does put this into perspective. Like, otherwise, none of your beeswax doesn't, doesn't affect you. <laughs> and um, so I thought that was funny. But yeah, so, but but you take all these things, you know, we can keep telling stories about weirdnesses. I mean, I think, I don't remember if I mentioned this on an episode, but I was getting a root canal a couple of weeks ago and the dentists were all, um, you know, masked up and whatever, but obviously to have dental work done, you have to take off your mask. And right, they're not socially distanced. Right, they can't. Yeah. I mean, I've got really long arms, like, um, like I have a really long drill, but they had to be like right there. And the guy's, you know, like six inches away from me. And yeah. 
I, I felt weirdly anxious, not because I was worried for my own safety. That wasn't weird at all. It was just, I have gotten into the habit of feeling like that is for lack of a better term, like proper etiquette. You know, I would, I felt bubble has definitely gotten enlarged over this. uh, Yeah. um, Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and the, just like the appropriateness of what you do. I mean, I almost felt as if he was saying, no, 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 like go ahead and eat with your fingers, you know, at a nice restaurant. You're like, Oh, I don't want people to think I don't know how to properly eat, you know, with a fork and knife. Like it's that sort of awareness, but, but, but then you look at this this is all very difficult and weird for every given individual. When you are in charge of a large group of individuals, it gets really exponentially challenging because I think any leadership decision, I think most leaders are are somewhat accustomed to and thickened skin over knowing that not everyone is going to be happy with your every decision. I mean, sure. that's just, that's right. like, par for the course. Right. That's the price Um, of admission to leadership. Yeah. You don't make it very far if you're like, I need a hundred (laughs) percent acceptance, but this is so fractured and so many levels. It's, it's almost like, you know, you'll be lucky if you have one or two people who are pleased with the way (laughs) that it's all shaking out, that it's, it's, it's really some super complicated. Well, But, but the, the displeasure with the leadership position had customarily been, I don't like the way you've decided to run the company in this aspect or made this decision to run the company. Okay. As a leader, you can deal with that. This person, maybe they don't know as much as you, maybe there's just a legitimate difference of opinion, but it's your role to make the call. And you did. And so you have these people who disagree and say, I don't like how you've chosen to run the company in this instance. Fair. But the the different area is I don't like the health decision you've made for me personally. That's a whole different realm. Yeah. You know, and and that's where the thick skin of, um, you know, being able to brook dissension Mm -hmm. isn't as useful because I can, you know, I'll take people's opinions into consideration, but I don't have a problem making a call on my company. If I'm right, great. If I'm wrong, yeah, I mean, it's right. I, I suffer that consequence. But here, it's much more difficult for me to make a mandatory decision with this issue, because I guess at its extreme, if I'm wrong and somebody I put pressure on to come in comes down with COVID or, or has these negative health ramifications, that's different than my not having a great quarter. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. And I think what's interesting is um I, I was reading some something, somebody sent along a thing about um whether or not you can uh de- demand's not the right word, but I guess demand that someone get vaccinated. Um, as a, as a, can you say like to come back to this office, you have to be vaccinated. And from what, from that particular, it was a lawyer weighing in. So I don't know to what degree this was based on like state versus federal or whatever. So I'm not saying this is the thing, but this is, um, and I have no way to validate whether she was right or not, but that one was saying like you, you can, um, that you have a right to, um, you have a right to say to be in this office, you have to be vaccinated, but you can't fire someone for, you know, they can't lose their job because of it. You have to provide accommodations. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? Because like, you can't do your job. So like, what kind of accommodations if you're not coming in here? And just the cascade of that is, uh, is pretty complicated. It's, it's very complicated. I mean, the, the, um, do you, do you so, think there's going to be like a big resorting of where people decide to work? That like as companies make their decisions, I that then people I are think like, that, yes, I think that, feel that right and, there's going to be part of it. Um, certainly, the kind of virtual um, experience you allow, or the hybrid, or your flexibility in that. Uh, just like people are going to decide to work at a place that shares their other values, right. you know, whether it's they give back to. The community, or they're they've got a a tangible rather than just a written personnel manual thing. Commitment to diverse to diversity. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that it's absolutely going to be a um, an issue in recruitment 
uh, yeah. as far as what kind of flexibility. And it's an extension, you know, to a certain extent, you can say, well, I want to know their their policy on maternity leave, depending right. on what stage of life you are or what, or I want to know how much PTO I get or how yeah. much, you know, do they contribute to my retirement? So I think it's certainly valid to when you're asking those questions to say, look, what is your flexibility on uh, my working virtually? Yeah. And, or yeah. or what is your what is your policy on is everybody here vaccinated? Right. Oh, I did read, I just read a very interesting rundown on again, this is one I have I still need to go like look up, but but I I did a quick search on it and it seems to be at least relatively accurate, if not completely, but because someone was citing HIPAA for like you can't ask people if they're vaccinated. And this guy was weighing in, he was like, look, I am a I don't, I don't think he said HIPAA lawyer, but like, that's his, just like you do business law. Like that is mm -hmm. what his world is. He was like, and it is one of the most wildly misunderstood things on the planet that, yep. that HIPAA is not a privacy of, I mean, there's a level of that, but it it is not basically, I don't remember any of the details. I just remember the whole point was you can be asked if you're vaccinated or not. That is not a violation of HIPAA. That's not where the privacy responsibility of what is actually in that law. It doesn't have anything to do with that, which I just thought was super interesting. No, and HIPAA generally applies to medical professionals anyway, you know. Uh, yes, it was like they have to be stuff. careful with your information. It gives you yes. no personal rights per se of, um, I should use that incorrectly. It gives you no personal rights um, about whether you can be asked about things. No, which no you can be asked that. So it's not like uh, in an interview asking somebody, do you plan to have children or, <laughs> you know, all of that stuff. Um, but there are certain, not HIPAA, but privacy laws having to do with, for example, if somebody in your organization um, tested positive, and so you have to send the department home or send, you know, whatever, you you communicate with your employees and you can say that somebody tested positive and this is what we're doing, but you can't say Bob tested positive, you know, because you can't disclose there. So there are privacy issues surrounding it, but that is not applicable to asking somebody, Inquiry. your employee or uh, so an applicant. Right. whether they've been tested. Now, the key is, what are you going to do with that information? Yes. And, and and here's a funny one that came up, which I think I know the answer to this, but I it was just another layer I hadn't thought of. One of my clients said, here's a doozy. He said, I have two people in my office who aren't planning to get vaccinated. They have openly shared that. He's like, and add another funky layer. He's like, one of them, I completely understand why. And so I, my, my inclination is to support it. And the other one I think is just, you know, believing thing, you know, it's basing it on things. He was like, I, I probably can't treat them different, <laughs> no. but you know, and, but that's, but he was like, but I get it. Like the one guy had Epstein Barr for like two years and his whole, you know, whole half of his face was paralyzed and it was a terrible time in his life. And he got over it and whatever. And and the guy is like dabbling his way toward being comfortable with it and isn't against it. But he's like, I just, I'm afraid for myself. You know, he's like, I've read the stuff that says it's not linked to those. And that, you know, he's like, but I'm just nervous. And, and he was like, I understand that. That seems fair. Whereas the other guy's just like, nah. And, no, you, okay. right. You, but yeah. you don't get a choice. You don't get to say, <laughs> I'm completely comfortable with you observing religion yeah. A, but I think religion B is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Right, exactly, exactly. And so his own kind of, I mean, hypocrisy is a little bit too strong of a word, but just like his own internal battle of, yeah. you know, I don't want to punish this guy for a legit reason. He's like, I'm not, that's the whole thing. Like, you don't get to play God in deciding like, you are correct and you are not correct. Like, like you can't, and and I'll, I'll tell you, um, I, I am someone who's a science nerd and I read all the stuff. And if I had read it and I was uncomfortable with it and I was in any kind of situation, you know, if to, if to continue to do the podcast, I had to get the vaccine and I wasn't comfortable with it. I wouldn't, you know, at the end of the day, nobody wants people telling them what to do with their bodies. Um, and you're, as a leader, you're in charge of, of keeping 10, 40, 250, 1,000 bodies safe. And that's, that's a, it's a big burden. Right. But, but you're right. So nobody should be able to, or could really tell somebody what to do with their bodies. You have to get the vaccine, but you are entitled 
I believe, as a leader to say, here are the the requirements for optimum performance in this position. And just as as in a warehouse, you might say, look, you have to be able to lift 40 pounds over your head. Right. You know, right. Um, or you must be able to speak Spanish in this particular thing, or you must mm-hmm. be able bodied if you're going to be a flight attendant because you have to be able to react in case of emergency. Um, Similarly, you are certainly within your rights to say, as my friend did in the story that uh, with which we began the podcast, um, that if you're going to take this position, the leadership that you have to exhibit is going to require in-person contact. And I think that's where it get, I think there has to be a responsibility on, on the leader side of that. Just in the same way, I think, and this is one thing I just want to make sure we touch on here. I think there's a responsibility of everybody involved to be re employees and employers to be extra vigilantly clear of your intentions and motivations for how you're feeling. You know, if if you just like working at home because you can do it in sweatpants, you know, then coming in, you know, using using safety and fear. Like, oh, I don't feel comfortable in the office. Like, like you, you got to take responsibility for that. Like that's, that's right. just a personal decision. So don't hide behind that. And I think for employers be really clear um, because a lot of, you know, sometimes what's driving employers to want people back is they just want people back. It feels like what they're used to. They like having people in the office. They're comfortable with that kind of project management. I, you know, I've had a couple clients who've had people who really wanted to stay virtual in positions that they didn't think were virtualable, <laughs> even though they've been doing it for a year. Um, but now that people are coming back, they didn't think it would work. And I've, I've seen some good results out of, okay, let's try it for three months and stay yep. really on top of what are the, what are the downsides to not being, and, and in a couple of those cases, the person who wanted to stay virtual was like, yeah, now that not, now that some people are in the office and some people are here, it, it's, it's, you're right. It's not working. And sometimes it works. And so I, I just think there's a heightened responsibility to check in with the, the, the pieces of your perspective and the things that you are building the rules and your truths out of, and just make sure that they're on some sort of solid foundation and not just picked out of the air of like, well, I like this and this feels right. And this feels well, good. But <laughs> yes. And I know we're running a long time, but the heightened responsibility, I completely agree with, but if you're going to set that, well, let's try it for three months in this new environment when some people are back at work and we'll check in. I think that you have to be incredibly clear on what the metrics are that you're using to yes. judge this. Yeah. Because otherwise you're gonna get yourself in this never ending um, three month cycle where I say, well, I'm kind of thinking sure. this. And you're, so you have to, hey, these are the things that matter to me. Mm-hmm. If in this new environment, we can accomplish it as shown by X, Y, and Z, then fine. But if we can't, you know, and that's that's where some difficulty arises because sometimes it's intangible. You know, not as as um, arbitrary as I just feel better seeing people in right. their offices, but sometimes there's something close to that. Right. I just think we work better as a team when when occasionally we're all in the same conference room. Could somebody be on a screen? Maybe, but there is some validity to I just think we work better as a team, yeah. and that's that's where. The well, let's see how we feel in three months can get you into a little bit of difficulty. I hear you. I hear because you, you can say like you know, as long as the project stays on time and under budget, it's working. But there can be things, as like you said, of of like, well, younger employees aren't getting to grow by listening in on the conversations mm-hmm. that are happening next to them, and and that's a that's a valid that's a valid thing. Yeah. I, I all like I said in the very beginning, I have so many more questions than answers, and. I think it just calls for lots more conversations and and beta testing things and you know in our in our efforts to to create new normals and bring things back in the way they want. I, I just think it takes a lot of checking in and asking people how they are. I, I think it involves having conversations that you may not want to have, but um but it will help in the long run to just keep having the conversations. Cause I think, I think what will, I do think what will happen is some people, if they're unhappy, will just quietly build their raft to leave. And you may not realize that's happening if you're not 
checking in. So as we're at the end of the episode, um, and we've emphasized the importance of conversations and checking in, where can people have additional conversations and check in about this topic? So you can go to our Facebook page. Um, actually, you don't even have to go to the Facebook page. You can go to sohere'smystory.com. And at the top of that, there are two ways to get to us. One, um, to join the conversation. One is to uh, join the Facebook group, which there's a link right at the top of the website. The other is to text us with our new little fancy pants texting system, uh, which you can do from the web page there if you don't if you can't remember this number, which is impossible to remember, which is 410-632-6894, which is 410, and then it does spell the word ment, M-E-A-N-T-94. <laughs> or something like that. So 410-632-6894, you can text us. And it makes my day when somebody uh, joins the little text group thingy, which we're just getting ready to start using. And uh, you do have to make sure you do the second step or we don't ever get your first text. So so make Jody's day. Jump on in. <laughs> so that's our story. But the discussion doesn't have to end here. No, it does not. In fact, we don't want it to. No, we don't. <laughs> That is why we actually have our private Facebook group. Which we started to make sure that we could get your comments, your rants, your thoughts. Your stories. Your stories. You can find links to that group as well as show notes and links to subscribe via email and how to find us just about anywhere you can possibly find podcasts at SoHere'sMyStory.com. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at SHMS Podcast. And since we know it takes a village. Yes, it does. <laughs> we'd like to thank our our village, our super talented, incredibly patient team. And occasionally snarky Ooh, team. Yeah, but in the best of ways. In the best Lovingly of ways. Lovingly snarky. Yes. <laughs> Good mockery. So, so a huge shout out to the people who actually help us produce our show. Uh, first, our sound engineer, Tom Hansen. Thanks to Christy Schmier for our brilliant show notes and all the other fantastic writing she does for us. And to Taylor Mathauer for doing... Just a little bit of everything. Including wrangling us. Including wrangling us. <laughs> Which is no small feat. No, it's not. This is Jody Hume. And I'm Elliot Wagenheim. And you've been listening to So Here's My Story. 